Yo, what's up, what's up, what's up? It is good to see all of these beautiful faces. This is Tales of the Cocktail 2020 digital, digital edition. We are so happy and so proud to see all of this melon up in the room. Can't believe this 18 years Tales has happened. This is the first time we're doing this. This is the first all black panel ever. And I could not be more proud to see all of your faces and to celebrate all of your accomplishments. We are having this conversation, however, because for all of the aggressions we faced, macro and micro, in the industry, in the world, for some reason, no one thought racism was real until about three months ago. <laughs> <laughs> all of a sudden, it was like there's an international Black Lives Matter movement. And there was a day in May when everyone blacked out their Instagram like they were in solidarity. And then they went back to their lives. Yep. yep. Yeah. Yeah. When we go back to our lives, we still have to fight with the aggressions, macro and micro. We're still fighting for loans out here. We're still fighting for recognition out here. We're still fighting not to be killed in the streets. And before we go any further, arrest Breonna Taylor's killers. 100%. Cheers to that. Arrest Cheers Breonna to that. Taylor's killers. Cheers to that. Yep. Cheers, Cheers to that. that. Amen. Real life. Well, mm. we're going to talk about this austere group of amazing human beings, we're going to talk about the performative nature of wokeness and the actual change we want to see in our industry. We're going to break this out into three categories. We're going to have brand people speak. We're going to have bartenders speak. We're going to have entrepreneurs speak. We're going to do this spade style. So it's not going to be people giving long oratories. That's not how we do things. <laughs> we're going to talk like we talk. Y'all get to listen in. Brand people, you're up first. Introduce yourselves, and we're going to answer the question. If you work for a brand, what's, what does it look like? If it's, what does the performative nature of wokeness look like in, for us? And what's the real change we'd like to see in our industry? Yola on, go. All right, I guess I'll kick it off. <laughs> go ahead, Lynn. Hi, my name is Lynn House. I'm the National Spirit Specialist and Portfolio Mixologist for Heaven Hill Brands. Um, there has been a lot of conversation. There's been a lot I've seen. I come from the bar industry, so I speak as not only a brand person, but a bartender. I've done my own work in an entrepreneurial style. I think the first things in brand world is really um, addressing systemic racism and how it, it um, is infiltrated and in what happens in marketing and in sales. Um, there is a phrase that we threw out, Tracy and I are co-founders of Tipping for Equity, and I give this phrase to Mary Pollack, and it was, it's decolonization of your brain, and that has been so powerful for me. I've been, like, thinking about this for a week, and colonization of our brains, even though we are in post-colonial times, still affects everything of what we do, how we market, who we sell to, who we pigeonhole, how we speak to. So from a brand perspective, for me internally, I've been working very hard to change that conversation and have people, you know, I hate the word woke. Woke just means you're not asleep and you're not dead. I like the word active. And so for me, active is a transitive verb, and that means listening, seeing, educating, organizing, and activating. You have to do all those things to actually create equitable change in our community, which will influence other communities. But from a brand perspective, we really have to look at the language that has been used, the pigeonholing that has been used. Um, the word urban, yeah. we all know is code. <laughs> it's code. It's code for black and colored people, you know. Or, or multicultural or, or multicultural. Or MC. <laughs> we all know what the code words are. And I think to from a brand perspective, for those of us who work within some of the larger companies to stay silent, silence is complicity. So myself personally, I have addressed all of our marketing heads and I'm like, I don't want to see anything that says the word urban or multicultural next year. I'm like, if you're saying this brand skews more for a black audience or a Latinx audience or what X audience, just be honest about it. But when you say we're, we're targeting this for the urban community, number one, you are making an assumption about that community that that is the only voice that community has. 
I'm a black woman who friggin' loves whiskey and tequila. I don't not skew for anything that any marketing team has put up for the urban community. I never have, I never will. And so you're pigeonholing, but you're also from a business standpoint, you are losing out on a on so much money of business. Yo, just 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 into it, Sam B. What's the quote? How much do black people spend in liquor a year? Three point five billion dollars a year. Three point five no. billion <laughs> with a B. That's the money that you'll use when you don't know how to address us respectfully. Well, that, and that's, I'm Tracy Franklin. I'm currently part of the Nearest and Jack Advancement Initiative, um, formerly the National Ambassador for Glenfiddich Single Malt Scotch. And what we need, and exactly, you're saying urban, you're saying multicultural, but what we're saying is we don't value that community. This is a, this is, this is a side project that we're working on. We're going to see if we can feel, steal away just a little bit of this, this monetary value from this community versus making us part of the culture and really looking at everybody as different as we are not this one monolith of like urban people Wait, is really really important did you yeah. just say look at treats us like we're a side piece watch out watch out it's early nobody's side piece Kind of, but, uh, but you know what? We do have some communities. We have companies that are gonna that are stepping up to put their money where their mouth is. So I am part of one of those. I believe this program is going to make a change in the American whiskey industry. And I am glad to be a part of that. I'm glad to be at the front, you know, at the forefront of it, really pushing change. And I hope that other organizations can come together and really create where they see an issue, create change, not just talk about it. That's it. We've got to be active, like Lynn said. You're, you're so right. We do have to be really active. Oh, sorry. Colin Sariapia, Trade Director, Culture and Lifestyle of Bacardi Brands. Great to be on here with all of you amazing people. But it's interesting at Bacardi, what uh, we've started to do is we have this series called uh, Real Voices, which is listening and hearing from people from the diaspora. And the thing is, we, something, we had one yesterday, uh, which is about cultural currency. And Something that our, um, our panelists said was that, you know, black people are not a monolith and, mm -hmm. and brands are really missing the boat when they try and pigeonhole black people into one box. And the opportunity, as you said, Samar, uh, is that the business is over $3 billion. That dollars and cents makes a massive difference to the bottom line of all brands. And the performative language that we've seen um, in the industry as a whole, I've really tried to, and everyone else at Bacardi, and uh, I'm sure Alicia's going to uh, speak about it as well. Uh, there's a lot of intentional um, actions that are coming uh, down the line, and representation is a massive part of that. Seeing people that look like us, that talk like us and that walk like us, really, really, really matters. And there's something um, that has really resonated with me anyway over this whole time of COVID is that uh, James Baldwin, when um, he said that, you know, you always told me um, it takes time. It's taken my father's time, my mother's time, mm. my uncle's time, and my brother's time, and my sister's time. How much time do you want your progress to take? And right about now, we are in a, in a position where I personally think we all need to start actioning instead of talking. All this is great. I love, I love it. I love the communication and us getting together. But right about now is really time for action. When we get off this call, we need to be doing something to change this industry. And the fact that we're on this call now is great, but it's taken away from us being out there actioning um, what we're doing and I hope people that are actually listening um, to this presentation today are not just performative or not just speaking uh, just spending all their time uh, speaking they're spending a lot more time actioning because now's the time for action Alan, what's the action we've heard we're enough let, let, let's be crystal clear what are we looking for in terms of action what do we need people to do well, what we need people to do, firstly, when it comes to brands, I think one of, one of the things that I've always um, been a great um, uh, kind of advocate for is representation. Getting more black people in the room. Do not be scared to say the word black. I'm, 
We've been saying it in our business. Don't Amen. Be scared to Amen. say black. Black is real. Black. Let's say black. Exactly. And that for me, I want people to intentionally um go out of their way to seek black people in the room, in their uh boardrooms, in their teams, uh now. Not tomorrow, not yesterday, not you know, give us a year, give us two years. No, let's do it right now. But Colin, anyway, we have God. our one black. We've got <laughs> our black person exactly. on the team. We've done that. What Ooh. do we do now? We realize that that's not enough. It's not yeah, enough. Yeah, but like, I'm going to throw this out. Not enough. <laughs> I'm going to throw this out as well. In the brand world, what we have the opportunity to do is lift other people up. Jackie, you know. This has been, Ariel's on here, you know. And when we go to festivals, when we go to events, we see the same old, same old hired over and over and over and over again. One thing that I have been working very ardently for the past three years within Brand World with the access to funds and stuff that I have is I'm hiring women, I'm hiring women of color, I'm hiring black people, I'm hiring LGBTQ when I'm doing my events. And it's shocking to me the amount of talent that is out there that nobody sheds a light on. Yeah, Vance is actually- Those for us who have access to equity and power, yeah. it also falls upon us to help lift our community up, shine the yeah. light and increase representation out there. It's not just CEO level, it's every, every level as well. Uh, more, more than yeah, just representation, I think, oh, sorry, Stephanie Simbo, uh, um, Global Brand Manager for Presentation. Sorry, I'm a bit phase, I'm a bit sick, guys, but I'm here. Um, <clears throat> I think, uh, <laughs> yeah. Hey, she's by herself. Hey. Yeah, supposed, listen, uh, it's important to be there, so I'm sorry, but F COVID, you know. Anyway. Listen, everyone, I want to say this first in Stephanie's behalf. Listen, she's actually sick and made mm -hmm. the effort to, to show up for this. So we thank appreciate you. We Hope appreciate you feel you. better. <coughs> thank you. Stephanie, drink some rum. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, but speaking of, um, you know, uh, representation, yes, of course, super important. Uh, but I'm going to talk about the rum industry more precisely. I think we also need to, as brand, uh, we need to start having those uncomfortable conversation, uh, especially when it comes to rum labor, uh, you know, um, most distillery owned by people that don't necessarily look like me, uh, or entire uh, category um, represented by people that have nothing to do with uh, the, the liquid itself. And if people want to, like, as, as, a, as, a, as a brand manager, I really want to have, I want to have this discussion. I want to push uh, my brand to have those uncomfortable uh, conversation because it's only in uncomfort that you actually start learning things. Yep. Um, yeah. if, we, if we keep having that status quo about, oh yeah, rum is cool, rum brings people together, but we don't talk about the fact that 99% of the, of the black people in the rum industry are in the land, are in the field, yeah. the, 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 and the, the, not in the offices taking the decision. Yeah. We, we've, been, we've been in cane fields for centuries. Mm. Literally. Yeah. Like mm. we're, we're be, and, and, and to be clear, like you can only grow cane sugar in a very narrow band <coughs> and it's only brown people that live in those areas. No brown people, no rum. <laughs> They've been eating off our table for centuries. Mm. Vance yeah. has been trying to get in this conversation for like 20 no. minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, it's all good. And so, and so is Alicia. I'm sorry. Like, I'll no. go after Vance. No, it's all good. It's, it's, it's all very interesting. And, and, you know, the movement is essentially coming to... Oh, sorry. Sorry. Vance Henderson, a national ambassador of, of Hendrix Gin. Uh, uh, this is this is a wild one. I'm, I'm going to say I started my whole brand marketing world for me started from a multicultural program, which was 
a test, you know? And having been in so many years looking back, it's wild that these, you know, uh, entertaining of the conversation or the topics of AA or multicultural, all of these code words for what companies really want to achieve uh, are, are, are looked at just from a test perspective or a test place versus something that we really need to be about. Right. Even in trying to figure out an answer to how brands respond these days to what's going on, what are we going to do? How are we going to do it? How are we going to say it? You know, a lot of it is wrapped in looking for a marketing answer versus looking for how do we really change. So my question I always throw back is, we can do one of two things. We can try to figure out what action we are going to take. Are we really serious about making a change and implementing action? Because that's going to take us one route. Or do we just want to figure out whatever answer we want to come in that's going to be lifted and just be in the conversation? That's how this thing has been, been approached. But it's, it's so very interesting. And we have to hold uh, these businesses and companies accountable for what it is that they say versus what it is that they do. And I'm not a test. I'm, I'm not a test. My program is not a test. Give me the opportunity and I'm going to show you, okay? Give me the opportunity, and I'm saying it for everybody, and I'm going to show you, and I know that to be the truth. So don't test me, and, literally. And, and don't to, test me. Put it out there. And, let's make it happen. <laughs> the reason there's so much excellence on this screen, in this room right now, is because there's no room for anything less if you are a black person. There's yeah. no room for nothing less than excellence. The it's only the truth. place for black mediocrity is jail. <laughs> and we yeah. don't do that. We yeah. all come excellent. It's the truth. And it's it's like everyone before us, you know, when it comes to civil rights, you know, having to like you said, having to be excellent. You can't make a mistake, like because the one time you trip, you do anything, then you fall into whatever the stereotype is. And you fall into, we and knew what it was gonna be, so we knew true. this was gonna happen. It's 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 the case. So the flip to that is that I am often more hard on our people who are in this industry because I know what's going to happen if we make the one mistake. We have to hold ourselves to a certain level and standard of excellence. And that, for me, that's not for anyone else. At, at the beginning and at the foundation, at the base of that, it's for us. We've got to be excellent in what we do for us first. And then we know what comes after. Because if we don't, well, we'll still be waiting like we have been. Hello, walls. Hello, walls. Hello. <laughs> no, I, I fully agree on that. Hello, everyone. I'm Erlisha Rochelle, uh, the National Ambassador for St. Germain. Um, and I, I think one thing that we really need to focus on and one thing that I think, especially at certain levels, like I'm at a national level now, it was totally different when I was on a regional level, but I actually touch our strategies. And so I think you have to hold your executive teams, your brand teams, your marketing teams accountable for what the long-term strategies are versus these programs that are not connected to any kind of proof points because companies aren't investing in any sites and in the black and brown communities. They have uh, white people who are creating programs that they then want executed by people of color. That is an internal issue. That is an issue that starts way beyond we even get to a level of representation. Mm -hmm. Also, when we talk about the internal piece, do we even have safe spaces for black and brown people to work in? I have personally worked in an environment of discrimination, 100%. I wouldn't want anybody to deal with some of the things that I've had to deal with. So as a person who's in a position to speak out, it then becomes my responsibility to take on that fight, to make sure that I am helping to create an environment that's actually safe for a Black person to work under. And that really does take having the conversations with HR, calling out discrimination. I've literally, I mean, there was a time when I tried to make every other um, reason why a person was doing certain things. Now I'm flat out like the person's racist. So what are we now going to do? We also need to be asking our, our companies, do you have discrimination clauses? You would not imagine how many of our huge corporations don't even have discrimination policies. That is absolutely unacceptable in 2020. So we really need to be, you know, like talking to executive leadership, 
talking to HR, talking to your management team, and making sure that the internal structure of your company is on a sound footing and actually anti-racist. Because every time you try to create a culture to then support black and brown people that is created from a foundation of racism, you're gonna always have a pigeonholed program because the program isn't actually really connected to the culture or really connected to creating change or connecting with all different kinds of people. Instead, what it is, is a marketing tool for economics. And I think we also have to frame it in a way of understanding that number one is just simple humanity and, and respect. And we deserve to have that environment of respect as black and brown people working for a corporation. And it's also a huge financial gain for your company for you to get this piece right. So however you have to frame it to who, 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 whomever you have to, I think those are you know a couple of the factors for me is really about hitting the internal structure hardcore. I, I'm really not all about the programs right now. I'm really, I'm, I'm really like, what is your long-term strategy? What agencies are you partnering with to create these media ads? I remember the first time I, you know, sat for a, a brand I was working for and they shared their, their deck, like their, their media deck. And this thing was so whitewashed that in the back of my mind, I was like, why did you hire me? I don't even see any recognition of myself on your national deck. So these are the conversations that I have with like our brand teams and our executive leadership. What agency partners are you using? Do we have anti-racism uh, trainings from the management level on up? What are those long-term strategies before we even can start talking about programming? Mm. And the, mm. the question I really, really like right now, and this is a question we can ask any individual or corporation, what are you doing to undo your complicity with white supremacy? Mm. Because all, all, of racist, this, racist. all of this. On my racist. hand, calling racist, racist. Yeah. And, 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 and asking companies, corporations, HR management teams to support an environment in which racists don't feel comfortable being here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and that's what they have, have to answer, you know, especially when you have right. these companies that, you know, have, you know, for instance, like British roots, you know, and, you know, they look at how they want to respond, you know, do you respond from a U.S. perspective? Do you respond from a global perspective? And U.S. is sitting around twirling their fingers like we're waiting for an answer because the answer's got to roll down you know, I call because out do you offend? Do you offend the world? Do you yeah. offend the world for the sake of you know helping out this segment you know of your consumer base? You've got to make that decision because at the base of it, it's right and it's wrong. So if the answer is right or it's wrong, the the the, answer, the question you're asking yourself is is, is surrounding money. Right. So you're talking about money, and I'm talking about right and wrong. What yeah. are you going to do? You gotta call out right. You gotta draw a line in the sand about what your values are for the company, and then. Values, yeah. values. You gotta draw a line in the sand. What are your values? They're either your values or they're not your values. It can't be a marketing campaign. It can't be this. It has to be, this is what we stand for. Um, and it's up to us, as Alicia said, to keep calling it out. Call out code, call out this, call out and say, this is racist, this is insensitive, yeah. this is offensive, you know. So. And if we don't see evidence of you living the values, if we don't see, you ev if we don't see evidence of your values in policy, they're slogans, and we are done with it. Right. We're done. All right, yo, brand people. Um, Martin, you next. So yeah, we want to we, give, we want to give Josh a table quick because Josh is taking exams today, and he literally mm. hopped out of his yeah, example uh, <laughs> to, to hop on with us <laughs> and have this what conversation. Are you taking, bro? I know. I'm so, nosy. What you taking? So what I did? What's up, y'all? First of all, hey, I love y'all. This is introduce super dope. yourself, huh? Hey, this is Josh Davis, straight out of South Side Chicago, founder of Brown and Balance, and just all around advocate for Black people all over the world. Um, but what I'm doing is, since we've uh, been in COVID, unfortunately, haven't been able to work. So I went back to school. I am in uh, an electricity program at one of the community colleges here downtown in Chicago. So I'm on my, what's this, my fourth, 10 classes. 
I literally got to go wire up a house real quick. You know what I'm saying? For my final <laughs> for this class. Um, <laughs> literally. So I like, I dipped out real quick. I did half of it, dipped out. I couldn't miss this. I couldn't, I had to be a part of this law, y'all. Thank you, Josh. Y'all. No, thank I'm going to be able to, sacrifice. I'm going to be able to listen. I'm going to have my earphones in and listen. You know what I mean? Try not to electrocute myself, but I had to Please be a don't. part of this. You know what I'm saying? Please. With all y'all amazing brothers and sisters of mine. You know what I mean? So thank y'all for this. I'm going to listen. I agree with everything y'all saying. Cause I know y'all gonna say all the stuff I like to say. You're just probably gonna sound a little smarter than I would say it. You feel me? Stop so it. Nah. <laughs> I got a dip. But nah. hey, thank y'all for this, man. For real, this is so, really so dope. So let's let's ask the question to the bartender group. Can you, can you start off for us, Josh. All right. Now, what does the performative nonsense look like if you are on the bar side of the industry, and what's the change we're looking for? Uh, personally, me, the change I'm looking for is I'm really, really tired of hearing people say they can't name. Uh, bartenders of color, black bartenders, they don't know who they are, they don't know where they work, they don't. If you get out of your pigeonhole for more than five minutes and just explore and visit and see the bartenders in your city, you'll find all those dope, amazing people that we all know because we're, we're a crew, we roll together. I always liken it to um, comedy, right? So remember way back early 2000s, Mike Epps was the man, right? So then Cat Williams came along and everybody kind of bumped Mike Epps out the way. Then Kevin Hart came along, everybody bumped Cat out the way. It was room for all three of them to be dope. So instead of just going to Jackie, to me, to Tiffany, to Ariel, to Alexis, to all the people like that, let's seek out that next crop of talent and let's you put this all on the same All of the room on this screen. Exactly. We're not crowding each other. There's space yeah. for all of our- There's room for everybody. We don't have to do it one at a time. We don't have to have the same faces everywhere. Let's figure out ways to get not us, because we, we do it already. We all know each other. We all talk. We all have group chats. I got three with you, personally. <laughs> you know what I mean? We all talk all the time, so it's like, it ain't for us to do the work. We need some of our counterparts and some of these people that are in the positions to step out of their comfort zone for a change. Like, we have to do every single day of our lives and seek out that next crop of talent and stop saying, I don't know who they are. I don't know where they are, because they're out there for you. Yo, this, I want to give props to one of the, the true OGs on the spot. Yo, Chuck, you've been in the game longer than most of us. For real. Like, back, back, back in like 2010, when it was just like Frankie and Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> you all was out here doing it. And Lynn, like, but from the, from the bartending side, I know you've seen change. What, what are we looking to happen? And what is the performance of bullshit we're not tolerating anymore? Is this for me? Yeah. Hey, okay, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'm Charles Hardwick. I've been bartending for around 30 years. Let's just leave it at that. Uh, most recently, I worked at the Mandarin Oriental here in New York City in Columbus Circle. Uh, man, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of issues that I've witnessed over the years. Uh, but, you know, something that Josh said just a moment ago really kind of like struck a chord with me. And that had to do with and it ties in a little bit with, with what some of the brand people were saying was this concept of like, there can be only one, you know, it's kind of like reminds me of that, of Highlander, you know what I mean? Like, like Highlander, right? Yeah, exactly. It's like, so they're like cutting each other's heads off because you feel like there's only space for one person, one black person there behind the bar. And in the era in which I really sort of started to take this more seriously, you know, we used to have a running joke about like, if there was more than one black bartender, the two of you could never be behind the bar together. You know, and it was like this, it was funny, but it was really a joke and, and humor that came out of pain and exclusion, you know? And I remember the first two black bartenders I saw, well, the first one really is this guy who's really a legend here in the city, he's an older guy. He's one of the founding partners for Employees Only. His name is Henry Lafarge. And I'm in Nell's, which I know Jackie knows Nell's, but that's like of a certain era. And this is probably 1986, 87. And I walk in and it's this very fancy, you know, club, supper club. It was my left at this place in Paris called uh, La Bandouche. And a band is playing and it's just elegant chandeliers. And I'm looking around like, wow. And then I see this brother behind the bar looking clean. He's got a nice uniform on. He's handsome, very New Orleans. That's where Henry is from. And I was just like blown away. I wasn't even a bartender. But as soon as I saw that, that just resonated with me so much. And it, it stayed with me 
up to the point when I became a bartender and it informed my perspective on what the profession could be and what, where I could fit in in the context of, of bartending. You know what I mean? It became something that I aspired to. Um, and far too often, I find that, you know, even as we're starting to have these kinds of conversations, you know, and, and this is certainly like, you know, of something of a call to action. You know, we're here like having a discussion as a way of like sounding the trumpet about what these things are that need to occur. Right. We also need to formulate a plan of action, you know, and what does that mean? You know, that means essentially like, okay, we identify the problem and then we come up with a solution for the problem or various solutions, you know, in, in as granular detail as possible. And then we come up with a plan for implementing those solutions. And for me, those involve a variety of things. One of them is mentorship. One of them is, um, you know, uh, repairing some of, you know, the damage, let's say, that the relationship between the Black community and the liquor industry, you know, has wrought, you know, through marketing and through pigeonholing and through really not seeing us as a, a varied spectrum of a community that, you know, has varying tastes and varying needs and varying concerns. Um, and then once we come up with that, you know, finding out how we reach those people. To me, you know, having a diverse staff and having a staff that reflects what the community looks like um, or not having that really represents a lost business opportunity there. Because the idea of what is hospitality, it's making people feel welcome, making people feel like they belong in your bar or in your restaurant. How can they feel like they belong or that they're welcome or they're wanted if they don't see some reflection of themselves in, in the bar or in the restaurant, whether it's among the wait staff or behind the bar. I single out the bar not just because I'm a bartender, but one of the reasons I wanted to become a bartender was there's a certain authority that goes along with being a bartender. You know, it's, it's a stage in the room, whether people drink or not, you know, when they come in, if they're waiting for a table, they're gonna to go to the bar, they're gonna sit down, they're gonna have a drink, they're going to interact with the bartender on some level, even if it's just to maybe like find out a little bit about what's on the menu, you know, but you're going to get a feel for the place lots of times, 90% of the time from, from the bartender. So that having, you know, black people behind the bar and more than one, and ideally getting past that place where there's only one bartender, or there can be only one bartender, black bartender working behind the bar at the same time, that, you know, will, will go a long way towards addressing, you know, and, and implementing, at least in some measure, that plan that I was talking about. So, I mean, to me, all of those things are really, really important as we start to formulate how we're gonna address all of these very issues that affect all of us. Yo, Frankie, you've been in the game for, for again, more than most of us, and you was cleaning up the competitions back when you were, back when, you know, before everyone else got in. You've seen a lot of change, a lot of change. Tell, I, I, tell us what you want to see happen. Ha, yeah, so I have seen a lot of change, actually, and it's been really interesting to, um, um, to, to, to witness. And I'm glad that, you know, that I've, I've been around a little bit and have had a chance to survey. And I hear calling on this call. Can we, can we name it a call to Blackshin? Should we just call it that? <laughs> <laughs> like that. <laughs> Hashtag call to Blackshin. You heard it anyway, here first. Um, one thing I did want to say before is, I, well, I think it's really great now that everyone wants to amplify the, the voices of people who haven't been heard and, and hire uh, people, whether it's people of color or, you know, LGBTQ, you know, Latinx, all the rest. Um, this obviously needed to happen, like obviously needed to happen. So I want to thank everybody who started that and who, um, and, and, and who was like working towards it. And I hope people are working towards it. Um, when I first started there, yeah, there weren't a lot of people of color. I did, but to be honest with you, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I, I didn't really question. I don't know. I just didn't feel. You were busy um, doing your thing. Yeah, I honestly, I was, I really was just kind of, you know, move along doing, you know, trying to learn everything I could trying to be really good. But honestly, I was trying to be really good at what I do and what I did because not because I was black, but because that's who I am. So I really just want to impress upon people that, okay, let me just go back for a second. So I personally do not want to, nor ever, I've been lucky that I haven't had to exist in just a black box, you know? And um, 
I, I want to be considered, I want to be hired because I'm, I'm qualified, I'm, you know, good at what I do, I'm the good bartender, or I'm a good educator, or I have the experience, period. That's it, right? So um, I, I don't want to just be one of these, you know, what do we got? Who do we got in the, who do we got the Latin box? Yeah, let's pull this one out. You're not, not, a, you're not a tick mark, you're not a check, you're not a, a I don't know, I don't know, I don't want to be a box checker for anybody, right? Um, that said, um, uh, for, like for those people who are being amplified right now, who are getting um, the exposure, that's wonderful. Definitely take advantage of it. Uh, but, you know, kind of as Vance was saying, make sure that you, and this is, make sure that you're good at what you do. However, if you're not yet good at that, just get to that point if that interests you. If that doesn't interest you, maybe this is not the career for you. Do you know what yeah. I mean? So. Um, it, it, there's two sides of it. So don't just hire people because they check a box unless they have the qualifications because you won't be doing them any favors, right? right? And you won't be doing yourself any favor as someone who's looking for results. So I just say, try to be the best if, if that's what really interests you. You know, find that thing that you love, if it's bartending, if it's education, if it's brand work and do it well. Not because you're one of these marginalized people, but because that's important to you. And that's what's going to make it authentic. Can, can I ask a question? Hi, Charles. Sure. Hey, how are you? Well, how so, are you? I think every, maybe everyone heard about the Wells Fargo CEO talking yes. about there not being qualified people out there. Remember, did, did you hear about that? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah maybe. So the reason why I bring that up is, you know, in, in the context of talking about being good at what you do and all that stuff, and I mentioned mentorship and things like that, you know, I think it's important for, if not me, then someone else on down the line to just, you know, address that kind of trope that exists that, you know, qualified people aren't out there and, and, and really discuss measures that we can take that will create qualified people. You know what I mean? Um, at some point, everyone on this call was not, you know, qualified for a certain job. I lied to get my first two bartending jobs. I put on my resume some places that had closed, and it said bartender waiter. And then I got in there, and this, and this brother named Rudy at Acme, which is still in the city, but now it's a fancy place. And I just faked it, and I had index cards, and he just told me how to make a margarita. And You, you didn't lie. You colonized those jobs. Yeah. I yeah, so, so I just wanted to just mention that in terms of just, you know, in the context of Frankie men mentioned qualifications and things like that. And I, I, I couldn't agree more. I felt the same way, but also I just, I think it's important <laughs> to talk about how to help and people become qualified. Trying to find Absolutely. your references, sir. Trying to find your references and uh, no one answered the phone. Help, 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 sir. Right. Well, <laughs> yeah. I, I, will say, I will say that the onus has to be on the individual as well. You know, you can absolutely go and seek mentorship, but for me, I took it upon myself to, to go to all the, you, you people saw me at all the events, <laughs> you know what I mean? All, all yeah, the learning that. I could, all, yeah, you know, so I made that Jump effort up. and I made yeah. the effort to go to event, to go to, I paid for myself to go to BCB, in Berlin, you know what I mean? I paid for myself to go to events. So, you know what I mean? You have stars to invest in your- Well, you staged in London as well in a few I st Yes, I did. I did a stage in 2011 in London and Colin helped me get there for sure. Thank you, darling. And and yeah, you know, I, I did these things because I wanted to do them. So you have to want to do them and absolutely yeah. reach out to people for mentorship. When I was with the USBG, I certainly helped uh, with mentoring people out of my previous job and I've asked for help. Ask for it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree no. completely with Miss Frankie. You, you you have to be intentional about your own progression. And it may sound it may sound selfish a bit, but I almost look at it like you know when we were on the planes and they say you know if something happens and you know the mask drop down, you got to put the mask on yourself in order in order to help someone else. You've got to make sure you are together. And if you're on the flip side, you have to be able to be intentional about bringing people along with you on on the trek. Because if we don't and what are we going to, are we going? I, I want to, you know, and, and the last piece I'll say to that is you also. Frozen. Yes, I'm going to actually take on Van's point because that's so important. Yes, being in time to know. I'm Jenna. I'm working for the Agile Brands, a new to world, mostly whiskey, but generally brands that are 
dare to talk to people and, and make their own buzz. So what, from my international perspective, what I've noticed is that I met Vance and I met Leira and I met Josh for one event. Yes. And for me, that thing really made me look at what do we miss a lot in the rest of the world? And that's kind of the power of community. What does community and networks open you up? It opens you up to social capital. Yes. Now we need this, the, the world we live in is one in which like you ain't got social capital, you ain't got brand interest, you ain't got power of influence. You just don't have that many doors that you could open yourself to be able to do your job. So how can we help other people get social capital because that's one thing that you don't come in bugs from when you come from a black background as you would if you come from 300 years of welfare in your family and having a clear understanding of how you access information and how do you set your demands and how do you know to stand up when uh, you are rightfully should make a move and it doesn't happen because of some of the reasons. Because we're talking about I'm talking about internalized beliefs and we're talking about biases and we're talking about sometimes being like, well, you might be good, but you got to work twice as hard. But when do you, how much do you run until you say, I'm enough, I'm good, I, I believe in what I can do and how do I make sure that we facilitate the like almost like talent pipeline in which when people get to that door and they might knock at it and somebody might open it, they are in the right door, it's not a trap. And they're kind of, know that they've got a support network to actually go there and take their own seat at the table or even better build their own, as Chucky likes to do. So my perspective is a lot about believing people. And I think it was Carla Harris who told like leaders of all CEOs that you grow your power by giving it away. And then, you know, we're not just going to have these doors of opportunity, but we'll ask people, hey, what walls do you need the doors to be in? And then people can get in on the doors that are at the world they were having as a barrier. And when they do that, phew, ideas, ideas make money. Diverse people come with diverse ideas. For me, that's how it works. Ariel, Tiffany, we've not heard from the two of you yet. Please, Atlanta and Chicago, speak up. What do, what's the change we're looking for? What's the bullshit we're not going to accept anymore? I can't hear you, baby. Maybe on mute. Unmute yourself. Un unmute Tiffany. Is it you know like every family reunion has that one person? <laughs> yeah, that's, oh, that's, person. <laughs> that's you. <laughs> she has to mute unmute it though, I think. She's so unmuted. You're unmuted, uh, Tiffany. She She's on me that something's wrong with her. I had that before. Let's move on later. Deconnect and connect again. And then your Zoom's going to reset up. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, All she right. was at the, at the table, you know, getting the potato salad when we was, uh, you, know, <laughs> you know how it was. Well, you, know, you know how this I, is. Like, and drop it. While they're fixing this stuff, we need to talk bad about it. Because that's... And dropping, and dropping her trumps as well. Yeah, like, bring what? me back some punch. <laughs> <laughs> no, Tiffany's here. Tiffany's here. Tiffany. Tiffany. I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. I'm waiting. I'm, I was waiting. I was giving, I was giving, you know, I was waiting for the potato salad to come to the table. I was hey, congrats, Tiffany. She made uh Dave Dave Hall of Fame. You know, yes. winning. Get it, girl. Winning. Yes. Uh. Yes. But no. But no. <laughs> I'm grateful. I, I can't deny it. I'm grateful. Um, Tiffany Barrier, they know me as a drinking coach. Someone is calling on me as Ladybug. Um, those personal friends. This is beautiful. This is great. Y'all know I get passionate. Um, my tears are not as loose as they used to be because this, this, this presence and this movement is really nice to represent, yet I don't see much really shifting. Um, I'm really grateful to have the award. It's really nice. Um, I'm getting mixed comments of long time coming, uh, what took so long, how many black women were there ever, how many queers were there ever, but the, that, that category doesn't bother me. It's really how much work that I put in. Um, I don't work for a bar. I don't work for a brand. I don't work for a chef. I am 
all by myself. Um, I use the word consult loosely, but I love intimate, beautiful projects. I love to show education, cocktails, hospitality, spirit and energy through the drink. That's what we all do. We just do it in different categories. For me, this time frame is important because I'm still a bartender. I, I'm going to make the drink all day, every day, but there's just been a missing link. I started off years ago. I didn't lie for my job. Glad I didn't lie for my job, but I wasn't supposed to get the job. I literally was like in the restaurant using the bathroom with a friend and the manager came over and said, are y'all waiting for the interview? And I was like, yeah, sure and popped it and popped it. I had the talk, I had the lingo, I had the look. Before you know it, I was behind the bar. I had no idea except how to make the normal things, but it was all about listening to the guests. I didn't know what I was doing. I just need to ask you what you want. How hard can that be to ask the guests, what do you want? Then they tell you, then you make it, and then you get paid. So I've kept that, I've kept that. <laughs> That's all it is. That's all it is. Um, I did keep that. I kept that for, for with me forever. Um, I dropped out of college. I just felt I love making people feel some kind of way. All the feels is an overly hashtag that I use, but this is what it's going to do in more than one way. I'm going to make you feel some kind of way. But when I started getting into it and some people started to watch me, they said I had this thing and I never knew what that thing was. But I was trying to keep up with Hong Kong and Sydney and South America and Manhattan and San Francisco on the style, the education, the fermentation, the okay, I, I wanted to nerd out. I wanted to nerd out, but I couldn't escape from the time frame of the stories. And they were all one sided. All this work that was being done was cool. But slavery has been going on for so long. And that's five of the seven continents. Like, Every continent had slavery. I mean, the first to make alcohol was in Babylon. And I'm thinking we're talking about this beer, we're talking about sake, we got gin, we got all the spirits, but why aren't we talking about the labor force? I'm missing it, I'm missing it so much. And I was very shy to share a part of who I was to the nerd that I needed to be on how I poured and how I presented. And, how crafty I was at work. And so um, there's only one side of the story that they share and I got bored. I'm bored of the same story. If we're gonna break down what the queen did and the master distiller did and, and all of those stories, why aren't we talking about the hands which were black? Why aren't we talking about the hands that work to make it happen? Let's own the fact that so-and-so Lord and so-and-so whomever they were owned, Mr. and Mrs. so-and-so, who helped them get here? I need the story. I need the real story because you're only giving it one-sided and that's through education. Um, hands down right now, there's yeah. only one book, there's not enough books. And yes, there's a book coming by Tiffany. But I, 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 I want the bartender, the American bartender, along with the international bartender, when we talk about American cocktails or cocktails in general, let's talk about the labor force. Let's just get out of, I mean, I love the science and the chemistry. I absolutely love it. But let's talk about the helping hands that help with the chemistry and the science. Because that one person wasn't the only one jotting down notes and, and making these, um, amazing beakers of whatnots, there was somebody else to help execute the thought, which was just as brilliant as that person. And I want those stories. I want bartenders to dig in. If they're going to nerd out, let's get deeper. And if you can't find it, look more. And then look some more. And then look some more because the story is there. You just have to search. I want bartenders to nerd out real. I want the real. Not because I'm Black, but because Black is what this industry is, service. I, I, Hands I, down. I, I cannot back Tiffany. Sorry, up. was I yelling? Oh. Yes, you were yelling, and it's all good. I cannot back Tiffany. I mean that. Enough. I cannot back Tiffany enough, enough when I say, we're not new to this. We have been here. We've been here all along. We started cocktail culture in this country. We started dive bar culture in this country. We've been here. 
Music, white jazz, fine dining, white tablecloths, the yep. outfit, the this. double breasts. Yo, That's us. You want to know why? Us. You want to know why Mickey Mouse wears gloves in cartoons? <gasps> See that face, Tiffany? Just I know. <laughs> oh. Walt did that on purpose. Right. It's a mockery. All of the cartoon mockery. characters, Goofy, yeah. all of those. That's a mockery. It's a showcase. It is. Uh, yeah. Oh, it's black. It's, it's, it's We're, black and it's service and it's real. And we can say, you know what? This help, the help named did that. Give them their flowers. Give it to them. I'm grateful for the flowers. I'm grateful for this whole panel. So what is flowers. Say, say, we ready. Speaking of ready. I'm, oh. I'm ready. Thanks Abiel, to you. Abiel, is your is your sound on? Are you ready? Oh, baby. Oh. oh. <laughs> Girl, <laughs> no. Can't get the take home plate. Come on, girl. Oh, 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 oh. All right. So here's what we're gonna she, do. She was supposed to use aluminum let foil, somebody, but she was using the saran her, wrap. <laughs> That's what happened. Me. See, that was happening. She went in the kitchen you looking for the saran wrap, and she just took the foil. See? Call one of us and talk. For real. Yeah. Call <laughs> one of us. I'm putting it on speaker. We gonna she do this right. Twice though, she had two different things going on. So, so he, he, here's here's what we're gonna do. We're going to give Ariel as much time as she needs to get the uh, to get the order straight because we're going to hear from her. But in the meantime, let's talk to and to the entrepreneurs. Yo, Clyde, you the OG in the spot. For real. <laughs> uh, Yo, I'm this, just old. But uh, one. Uh, Thanks. Can you guys hear me? I got years on everybody on the room, so. Yeah, yeah. But uh, for me, when it comes to this topic, um, as someone who's been an entrepreneur in spirits for now going on almost 20 years, um, I'm just amazed now at the support that Black-owned spirits and wine companies are finally getting. Um, it makes me very happy. It's, it's one of those things where it's finally, like, I've been – you know, jumping up and down about this now for almost since 2002 when we launched our, our first company. And I remember a very distinct story that my um, business partner just told me was we had our plan, we were going, and we met with the guy who had owned Belvedere Vodka at the time. And we thought like, wow, this is going to be our first. He really likes what we're doing. He, we flew up to Minnesota to meet him and talk to him. And he said, oh, you guys are pretty smart, um, but nobody's going to help you guys. And I thought to myself, like, damn, I've never been told that I was smart because I'm because you grew up. You're, you're, like, you're, like, you're, you're smart, but did you realize that you're black too? I what's funny, <laughs> what's funny is I was fresh out of business school where you have these ideas that if you go to school, you put your stuff together, you're gonna get investors. But it's very different for black people. And Ooh. and for that person to then say those things to us and then say, Oh, yeah, we're smart, you guys are good. Oh, rum. I didn't realize that rum would be that interesting. And then 18 months later, I launched Tin Cane Rum. You know what I mean? Like, like literally jacked the ideas from, from you, you. And, and just being a young black entrepreneur in those times and, and not getting um, the recognition. Like, I think one time we were in Wine Enthusiast. It was, they said the three top the cores in the world. It was Castries, St. Germain, and Canton. But here I was sitting out there at Southern Wine and Spirits, sitting outside, waiting for a meeting for seven hours, and then told to come back the next day. And then, oh, why don't you come back a month from now? You know what I mean? And these are the, the struggles that we endured. But what I, I want people to say is continue to support and also encourage Black entrepreneurs. Because a lot of Black entrepreneurs, their dreams die um, I think one, somebody running for office one day said, so many entrepreneurs die in the bank parking lot. You know what I mean? Yeah. So many of our dreams die because we're not connected to wealth and money and capital. But we need to be able to encourage each other and look for ways to support each other both financially in the purchase of our products and goods, but also in the financing of our dreams. Because I, I've seen many of these white kids come out with liquor brands and daddy's write millions and millions of dollars of checks over and over and over again for and, brands that suck. You know and, what I mean? And here's the fun part. 
when their brands fail, they go, oh, we didn't have enough money. And then yeah. they get more money. <laughs> oh, no. And, they, and then they fail, and then they get a job at another brand company to run that brand. You know what I mean? So, so, so it's, 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 it's it is um, mind-boggling. They, it's also the ability to fail forward and to get other opportunities and to make sure that we're allowing Black people to, to learn that failure is not um, fatal. And so many of us live in that kind of box. And so change for me is seeing Black entrepreneurs getting opportunities to, to sit at the table, to, to get capital, to able to, to actually produce products and out, out saying this is a product for Black people. Because every time I created a product, they wanted to, be, they wanted to make it BET. They was like, oh, this is for <laughs> Black people. Versus saying, no, it's just good rum. Yeah, you correct. know what I mean? And, it, 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 correct. and that makes a, a huge difference. Um, so that's what changed it from performative to being real, is treating, giving Black people the space to create, supporting the creatives in our business, and also encouraging us for, with those type of opportunities and getting the, the actual education and learning that we need to succeed. So if you're black and you, and you listen to this, if, if I mean we're saying black, but we want to, you know, people of color, you all included too. If you're black and you listen to this, yes, do your thing, be excellent, as Vance would say. If you're not black or person of color, you'll sign the check. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, we got check to sign too. We need to sign our own checks because right. even even when we're raising capital, like it, it's hard when you're going to like. I, I raise capital with black people and white people. The questions you hear from the people, the black people raising money were just very different. You know what I mean? And <laughs> at, at sometimes it was, it was borderline, not insulting because we're also new to investing too, in a lot of ways. So it's just, a, it's a lot of work both way around. Yo, we got, Ariel, is, is your sound working? Can you hear me? Hey! hey. Woo! Welcome oh, she's to the table, back. girl. She's Yo, we back. saved the plate. <laughs> All right, we're going to dip out of the entrepreneurship conversation for a minute because Ariel needs to speak about the bartender side. We can go come back. But we okay. got some dope conversations lined up for you. Please, while your audio is working, tell us what's the change <laughs> that you need to see. Okay, so one of the things that, and uh, during COVID, I um, just called a lot of brands out. Um, sometimes I get the phone call to make sure that I bring my friends to some of these events. I'm not bringing my friends to any of these events if you're not going to help educate, put things in their community, or treat them like they deserve to be treated as bartenders or servers or anything else. Um, so I made that very clear and I decided to only work with people who would work with me to make sure that we can hold the door open for others and leave the crack open for ourselves. Um, in that, um, Tiffany can attest to this. We also decided, and I don't want to speak for Tiffany completely, but um, I'm not being, I'm not going to be on any more conversations about being the only person in the room or the black woman. You know that I'm black. You see that I'm black. There's nothing else that's going to change about it. There's no history about what the, um, there's no history about how you're going to help me improve. Um, the only thing we can do at this point is stop the conversation because that's not getting us anywhere. Let's talk about what we can do to make the change happen. How can we hire more people of color? How can we hire more women? When you are hiring, let's not just talk to your friends that know three friends who are also white or male, no offense, but who else are you talking to? Who else are you hiring? Did you look for these talents in, in other places? Um, and then let's stop shaming. No, no, no. Some, some offense. Like if you don't want talented black people, that's on you. We out here. We've been here. And start so, hiring for different skill sets as well. Um, value bartenders do very well for that nice little crowd. Um, cocktail bartenders can also help educate the value bartenders, but we don't talk about that. 100%, you know, because they're looking at top tier. Who's going to help us that's top tier? Who's going to help us that's secondary tier or tertiary tier? And when you exactly. start to you know, assess, oh, we need people of color, and where do they plug in in those tiers? 
man. Right. Oh, and the other thing me. is this. Do not think for any second of any day that you are going to pay me $50 or a gift card to do any work. It doesn't work like that. You would not bring that. You would not bring that to my white counterparts. You wouldn't. Yo, yo, I literally how, how had many? someone, I won't say their name, but they wanted me to make three cocktails and, and they wanted me to do it around Juneteenth. And I was like, well, we already have something going on for that day. We can put you on a schedule. And these people were like, no, we need your recipes. No supply, no um, no check. And, and then it was like, well, can you go get the bottles and we will no. no, and stop doing that. I, I am not to be cheapened. We are not to be cheapened. The answer is no, I'm yeah. not doing it. And Tiffany, nobody that I know is going to do it either. Tiffany, how many people offered to pay you in food? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, if I could pay Georgia Power in bottles and food, uh, since I've been on this call, I've gotten a bottle to the door. If I could pay in food and beverage, I'd be okay. Thank but you. But I can't. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't. Right? Uh, and, and, and no, I don't need exposure. People die from exposure. Oh, you want to know what my favorite line for exposure is? I will decide when and where I get to be exposed. Right? I'll expose myself. Thank you. I'd like to choose my exposure. You know, there's this week, I'd like, like to choose that I want to be in this magazine, this article on your IG. I want to make that choice. But when they put in the email, of course we're gonna tag you. And I'm like, tag? What does that mean? My <laughs> sons can't eat those tags. Tag right. does right. not equate to dollars. I can't, I live in Brooklyn, I pay rent. Right. I got kids. Mortgage. <laughs> <laughs> so we, got, we got two superstars we had not really heard from yet left. We got Ian and Samara, please like. And Leah. Yeah, and Leah. Leah. Oh, like, more importantly, Leah. More importantly, Leah. Leah. Oh, Leah, I'm sorry. No, that's enough. Grab the mic. I'm gonna grab the mic. Thank you. So, I'm Leah Jones. Thank you very much. I'm Leah Jones, and I'm the C uh, the executive director and founder of Diversity and Wine and Spirits. And listening to this whole conversation, we touched on um, we touched on different topics, but there are words to what we were describing. It's discrimination, it's tokenism, and it's, it's exploitation, right? So this is what I really wanted to focus on, is exploitation. Uh, so looking at the, the definition of exploitation of labor is the use of power to systemically extract more value from a worker than is given to them. And so when I look at the industry and their response to BLM and what we're gonna do, I, I look at some of these pledges and some of these initiatives and I really sit here and I'm like, okay, so we're going to give you a platform, you know, to do this and do that as if that is the gift, as if that is a benefit. And so for me as a leader, whenever I do get approached by a publication, they get the work. There's no one, there's no article, there's no publication that I've been in where I have not asked, what do you look like internally? Do you have some kind of diversity pledge initiative or statement um, regarding discrimination because I know that as a leader, my responsibility is to ask those questions. I know that there are people that aren't in the positions that we are in that haven't had visibility. You know, when we think about Black Lives Matter, when we think about um, Latinx Heritage Month, we think about people that have been historically marginalized that haven't had an opportunity like other people, like our counterparts, our white counterparts. And so there are people in our industry that don't know their value because they've never had that opportunity to know, hey, if I participate in this initiative, you know, you're supposed to get this amount of money that you get, you know, you get money for actually giving some kind of, you know, shout out to a brand or an Instagram post. There are people that don't even know that you get paid for it. And so I see a lot of things going on in our community where I'm like, well, exploitation and tokenism is your response to diversity and inclusion. And I see that happening often because most of the time when we think about diversity and inclusion, we don't think about 
or I see that the mistake that I keep seeing, and Samara, please chime in because Samara has diversity distilled, and we talked about this a year ago. When we, were, we talked about this a year ago when you were forming this. There are people out here saying, well, we don't have diversity on our team, but we're going to create a pledge or we're going to create a position. People that don't look like me, I'm fine with creating diversity initiatives. If you have someone that is a diversity, equity, inclusion professional, someone that is trained, what I do in diversity and inclusion is something that I've, you know, had mentorship doing. I've actually gotten trained, you know, and Samara, she just, she just got her certification for diversity and inclusion with Cornell University. You know, this is not something we're talking about the livelihoods of people. So if you and like Joe Schmo and whoever and where whatever, Josh, not Josh, but whatever, John Doe from wherever is sitting down and saying, well, I'm going to get this one black person to come on our team. And this is our diversity council with, with whoever is marginalized. And we're going to create diversity. You're doing a disservice, not because of, you know, you're doing a disservice, not because of the initiative, but because we're thinking about human beings. We are human beings before anything. You know what I mean? And so we really have to think as leaders, who we deal with, who we work with, we need to ask these questions when we get hired. You know, Alicia, you, you mentioned you've worked in places that you've been discriminated um, and you want to create spaces as a marginalized individual where you feel safe. You know, so as leaders, it's upon us to say, I'm not messing with you because you don't got your house in order. You know what I mean? And I'm gonna tell people you don't have your house in order because you're not doing anything to solve the problem. You need to get money behind diversity and inclusion. You have to have a plan and it's not overnight. So stop tokenizing us, stop exploiting us and stop being discriminatory and do the work. Get that money, get that budget. Because we ain't, we ain't playing no more. Thank right, you. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. From Belize. From Belize. Right. Where you're all, where you're all out of rum. <laughs> yeah, but I got my Applejack. I'm good. I got some Applejack right here. <laughs> no, we, we, we still got people we haven't heard from. Sam? I'm, I definitely just want to piggyback off of what Leah said. I'm Samara Davis, uh, founder of Black Bourbon Society and also the founding director of Diversity Distilled. Um, and, you know, I, I've, I've sat and listened to everyone. I've been on mute, like cheering and, and commenting on mute. So I, I, cause I didn't want to interject everyone, but, um, every, this entire conversation is why Black Bourbon Society was started going back to the brand. Um, just let me back up. I came to this industry as a consumer. And so, you know, as Arlisha said, someone who was, who was in this industry and Lynn and Vance had said, um, you guys have seen those marketing directives. You guys have seen what they consider to be multicultural, AFAM, and all of that. So I have been, um, I, I am that target audience. I've been in those events um, as that person that is supposed to fit in the urban demographic. And you all know me. Uh, when I came into this industry, I was and a young 30 some odd person, now I'm almost 40, but I'm in my 30s, I was married at the time and had two kids. I didn't necessarily fit the, demog I didn't fit the description for urban demographic. In fact, if a rapper had a bottle, I didn't want to drink it. Like I, like that's not, that's not me, you know? Hey, rappers have great taste in liquor. That's all I'm gonna say. No, I want the premium stuff. I want the good stuff. I want the product that you go over to Beverly Hills and do the five course dinner pairings for and have the lovely uh, hand dipped glasses and, and, and customized names etched on the bottles. That's my crowd. And so I, I didn't. I just want to say, I just want to say, I don't fit the description has layers. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, I think if you haven't seen, if anyone watching this, uh, this seminar has seen, you have gotten a wide spectrum of what blackness looks like in this country and across this world. So um, no, there's definitely layers to what blackness and what the AFAM, using those terms, um, what the AFAM demographic looks like. Uh, so anyways, I don't want to ramble so much, but I definitely wanted to add to this that you know, we created Black Bourbon Society to prove to the brands 
really and to really show what the to, to the brands what the black consumer looked like from again from my perspective because this is layers and so from 20, 2016 to 2020 we have over 20,000 examples of what blackness looks like in this country and the brands have had an insight on our demographic from Chicago to LA to New York down to DC in Atlanta and New Orleans you can they have all worked with me to produce events so they can actually see us for us not what's on TV not what stereotype is written in your marketing directive not what your company CEO or your marketing executive has said is the directive to reach consumers of color and they are not consume they are not colorful themselves so you know we really created this boots on the ground visual for who we are and in the whiskey industry especially going back to Lynn um, you know some of our our, our biggest and best whiskey brands are in the middle of nowhere, Kentucky. They have no idea what we look like. <laughs> <laughs> they have no idea. They've never met us. They know, but the only, their only view of us is, 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 is from a field. Right, right. And, and, and so, oh, there's a layer to that, but I, I don't have enough time to talk about emotional free labor. <laughs> but I will mm -hmm. say that, um, I, I, I hear you all, I agree with you all, and um, we, I, I, that's, I think you, I, I, don't, I don't think you guys understand how much I've been inspired by um, you all, just sitting at the tables with you. We all got a chance to sit at a table back in 2016 and t at my first Tales of a Cocktail, and that table was a shit show. But I was able to lay eyeballs and shake hands and get to meet you all and follow you all and, and learn your stories and learn your backgrounds and really start to shape not only Black Bourbon Society, but diversity distilled off of your needs in this industry. And so I've seen you guys play tokenism. I've seen you guys be the only. And I, sh I cheer and I root for you. I root for everybody Black. Um, but I want us to think different about how do we open the doors for more people like us, the rock stars, the, the leaders of this industry to come through. Um, and that's really where, that's a part of the work of Diversity Distilled. And the other part of Diversity Distilled is getting in, in the brand's tails and <laughs> saying, yeah. we need to do this. It can't just be on the, in the on and off premise. Your, your black talent, your diverse talent just can't be at the bottom. It's yes. got to be in the leadership positions. It's got to be at the boardroom. It's got to be making the decisions for advertising and marketing. It's got to be in HR because people who, <laughs> people with hiring decisions hire people who look like them. That's called bias. So we need to be in those, we need to be in the positions to hire people who look like us too. So let me stop, but thank you. I love y'all. Like, <laughs> this is so important. Speaking of leadership positions, let's wrap this up with Ian. No. Wow, that's, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go and get. I'm gonna go and refill my glass for this one. Yeah, get some, yeah, get some I was thinking glass. the same thing. I'm like, I need a new drink for Ian. Yeah, go get some gray goose. Uh, <laughs> I'm, calling, hey, I'm getting I, some I don't need to, to, I, bro. I don't oh, to say anything. I don't need to say anything because refills, refills. <laughs> refills. I, honestly, I don't need to say anything because all the people that I was quite admire and idolize have all said it in front of me. I'm like, wow. And then Samara just finishing up by saying pretty much everything I wanted to say uh, as such. It's a, it's a case of, I mean, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very fortunate because, fortunate and unfortunate, but fortunate um, in the sense that I'm coming from a, a, uh, a Caribbean British perspective where I'm living here in the UK. Um, most of you guys are in the States. And, uh, and I said this, I think I said this to Jackie before, and I've said this a few times, um, that I don't, when I leave my house um, to go down to the, the local store, or I jump in my car, or I send my kids across town, I don't have to worry. With, the last thing on my mind is the fact that I may not make it home, or my kids may not make it home. That's the last thing that worries, that, that's on my mind. And that's the reason why every time I see people like Jackie and Clyde, Tiffany, Lynn, um, Leah, I know you're, you're Belize, but you always in the, I only meet in America. Samara, I can't remember if we've met, but we should meet enough. I love Charles, like, cooked food. 
<laughs> such Josh of course. When I see you guys, I applaud you because I don't know what it'd be like for me to have to constantly be with that, that burden on my shoulder that I may not make it home. I may not make it home because of the system, because of the society that you guys live in. So I applaud you guys for that and love you like, as I said, like cook food because I've got it a little bit easier over this side of the pond um, because uh, our police don't carry guns <laughs> uh, for one. <laughs> um, so yeah. But, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, still yeah, yeah, you didn't but, um, yourself properly because you have a rum. Can you, your your rum is the first. You you. I don't want to go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Ian. I mean, I I've, I I I came from a background where I left school and uh, my best friend said, "Let's go work in a bar." I was like, ah, "A load of rubbish!" But I'm going to work in a bar. And once I started working the bar, I said, "That's it for me." And I was very fortunate to be made the first uh, rum ambassador in the UK for a Jamaican rum company. Um, and that was the last company I ever worked for, last company, uh, because I always, realized, I always realized that I wanted to create my own value. Because when I looked around the society, black people were never given their own value. They were told what you're worth. And I was always been taught that, listen, you create your own worth. You create your own worth. And that's why ever since the early, late 90s, I worked for myself and created my own job. I created this <laughs> rum ambassador shit. <laughs> I just like, want to say this again. Who made you global rum brand ambassador, Ian? Global. <laughs> made himself. I made it myself. I was, I, was in, I was in New Zealand talking to some bartenders out there. I got sent out there by Appleton to represent them. And I'm talking to these bartenders and they asked me questions. I'm probably one of the first black people they ever saw. And they looked at, they were like, asked me all these questions about rums. I knew about Jamaican rums. But I knew about, I didn't know about other rums. So I took it upon myself. I said, I'm going to take all my savings and travel around the Caribbean and teach myself. I'm going to teach myself because I'm not going to rely on anyone else to give me a handout and say, oh, but I'm going to do it myself. And then I'm going to be confident enough to basically say, you know what? I'm the best. I'm the best at what I do. It doesn't matter if you want to what's called prejudice me. In fact, if you prejudice me, you're giving me an advantage because it means you're lesser than me. So I've got an advantage if you prejudge me. Uh, when I walk into a room, when I walk into an event, when I do a presentation, you're prejudiced to me. The first time BCB allowed me, well, they, they did the first year, the second year, they said, oh, we want you to do a presentation. What did I do? I went up on stage and did an hour and a half presentation where I pretended to be Tom Bullock. Did the whole presentation with an accent. American for you guys. <laughs> did the whole presentation, little glasses, bow tie. I pretended Thanks. to be Tom Bullock. Yeah, back in 2008 in Germany just to try to educate these guys because I realized the only way I was going to get my message across to the mainstream, the only way I was going to hopefully, hopefully inspire other people that look like me was to tell stories, stories that I could either relate to or stories they could empathize with. And when I did the whole Tom Bullock thing, I pretended to be Tom Bullock, taken from 1919 to 2008. I was making cocktails all rum-based because being a rum ambassador, all rum-based. And I was even having a joke that someone said to me, oh, you know, by the way, the president of the United States is an African-American. And I was laughing. I was like, that's not true. Get the hell out of it. That, that, get the, that can't happen. Because it was true. And that's, that was the progression in, in, in your politics. But I wanted to try and get a message across through a drink, through a cocktail. And, I, and that's where I realized that it was more than me. It was bigger than me than just being a rum ambassador, talking about rums around the world. I was hoping that I could actually open the doors for other people. And what really hit home, and it took me a few years to realize this, is when I was in South Africa three years ago in Cape Town. I was there, again, launching Appleton, working with Appleton out there. Um, and I got invited to a cocktail event. And I was, I mean, it always brings, always brings tears to my eyes when I, when, I, when, I tell, when, I, when I tell this story. There was a bartender there. Um, he was making a cocktail and I looked at the session of the bartenders and I knew five of the bartenders. The only bartender I didn't know was a black bartender that was there. And he was from a small township. And he decided he loved cocktails. And he decided to make the, enter this cocktail competition because he got a job in, in Joburg, sorry, Joburg. And the, the guy that won the competition was a representative for Diageo. I think he won world class or represented world class for Diageo. The second bartender was Academy uh, Bacardi uh, Legacy winner. And the guy that won became third was a black bartender, the only black bartender in the whole. In fact, there was three black people in the whole room, me, uh, the bartender, and one of his friends as well. And when we had a conversation, it was a great drink. When we had a conversation, he says, Ian, I saw you online 
and you are one of the reasons why I do what I do. I got so much grief from my mum. I got so much grief from my dad. They wanted me, wanted me to be a doctor. They wanted me to be um, all these types of high profile jobs, but I wanted to be a bartender. And I looked at you and I said, well, if he can do it, why can't I? And I cried. <laughs> I mean, he's bringing, bringing tears to my eyes now. Yeah, I cried because for me, that was so, so touching and so inspiring that I'd, even, I'd never even met this guy before in my life. But the fact that I could touch him and hopefully inspire him makes me say to myself, I'm here for more than the re I'm, I'm here for more than this rum thing. This is why I created this brand. I'm here. It's not about rum. It's not about me. It's about your legacy. It's about what you, we can do to open up doors for other people and bring other people. Because we are marginalized. We are persecuted just because of the color of our fucking skin. Can you believe that? In this day and age, in this day and age, in 20 fucking 20, that we can be persecuted, be shot at, be, uh, whether it's overt racism or, or uh, because, because we're black. No, this is, it's just, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And we, and this has to be a start. We need to be doing this all the time. We need to be doing this once a month, once every couple of weeks, because we need to hold this industry account. All this lip service about, they're going to be doing this. We're going to be doing that and hiring this person. That, yeah, fine. Do it now, but let's make sure you continue doing this in the future. I don't want to hear about Bacardi's initiative if they're not doing it next year and the year after. I don't want to hear about Plantation changing their name, saying they're going to change their name, if they're not going to, if, if in a year's time, it's still called Plantation Rum. I don't want to hear about slave rum in fucking Denmark that I, that once I wrote about it online, they then said, oh yeah, and the Danish government, the Danish media started getting involved and then them coming back and saying, oh, you know, yeah, we're going to change our name because it was insensitive. you dead right, it's fucking insensitive because of no one inside your boardroom that was black that could actually say to you, that's a fucking stupid name. Oh. That's a stupid name. Tell them. That would be like having a, a meeting and changing your brand to fucking Jane Walker and having no women there. That's how stupid that is. So what we need to do is us. This is the start. Yeah, let's, let's hold this industry to account. We have the voices. We have the power because we, 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 we're creating a power. We have a platform here. Let's use this and let's work together. Let's work together, not have dots, dots, dots here and all individually doing our stuff. I want to work with Samara. I only drink bourbon every now and again, but trust me, I've learned more about bourbon through Samara in the last year than I had in the first 25 years of my industry. So let's all work together and get, this and get us and get what's called people if you want to call them people of color, call them people of color. I'm going to call that is get black people <laughs> um, in this industry at the level where we need to be making the decisions, employing people that look like us. And if you're going to be an international brand, you're going to be an international company. You need to appeal to an international audience, not one type of audience. So Wait, um, I, I, I guess he wants to say something, but before he says something, I want to tell, I told him this personally. I said, thank you for letting me be a part of this because he had only a certain amount of spots to allow us to have this conversation. There are so many other black professionals that didn't get to have this opportunity. And it was only because we have to think about time, you know? And so, yes, I appreciate this so much, Jackie. Um, to thank you, Jackie, as well. Yeah. You know, so I just want to say thank you. I think we all got to say to Jackie, thank you. Now this, now, now this, let, let me be let me be clear. This is not about me. This is about all of y'all. This is about black excellence. You are all future ancestors. We stand on the shoulders of those who came before us and those who come after will look at our sacrifices and the examples we set and be able to change the world in their way, in their time, with their tools. So thank you all for your examples. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you, Tails, for letting us have this conversation. And, I, and, and, oh. Bye, and, I have one more thing to say before you close They convicted out. one of the Brianna's killers, Tails. Convicted or indicted? Indicted. They indicted one of Brianna's killers. You gotta have an indictment before you convict, though. What, what does indicted mean for a great? a lot of indictments and very for, few for a British person. <laughs> we, we, gotta, we gotta start somewhere. They indicted one of her killers. That's something, it's not enough. Oh, but I, I did wanna say this one thing about Ian. I've known Ian now over a decade long, and I was so impressed when I met him. I was like, this dude has made himself the global rum ambassador. And yeah. then I said, you know what, Ian, I'm gonna be the defender of rum. 
And he says, he said, who's attacking it? And I was like, shit, nah, that was back to work. <laughs> Sam, you had something to wrap up with? I just want to say, you know, Jackie just announced that uh, one of the officers, one of the three officers involved in the murder of Breonna Taylor was indicted yeah. to walked away with no charges or whatever. Um, and I have to say this to the brands. I have to say this to our colleagues. I have to say this to everyone else in the industry. These black faces that you see and the black faces that you work with, the black faces that you pass on the street, all carry the burden of Breonna Taylor's murder on, yeah. her, on their backs. We yeah. have to brush that shit off every single morning and perform and, and go to work and do our task and yeah. file and make our deadlines. But we do all of that knowing socially that this falls, that it is a weight on our backs. Correct. So, when you're in those offices with your black and brown employees and you are being very inconsiderate, demanding that they give you something in the moment, demanding that they respond to your email in the moment, pause. Because we got a lot on our brain. We're hurting. We yeah, are actually, hurting. Can I, can I, uh, Everybody in this year is hurting. Everybody has experienced a loss, a loss of some kind, a loss of job, a loss of a family member, a loss of a friend due to COVID, a loss of something, a loss of financial income. Like we are all hurting in that way, but add on top the burden of being black to that. And so this is why performative blackness is, or for fake wokeness, you're in the, move, the, in the movement today is not acceptable because we live this every single day of our lives and that pain, that stress, that burden on our shoulders will not go away. So yeah, we need to respect that. Can I throw something in there to what Samara said? Yo, throw it up, Josh. So yo, to yeah. what Samara said, and that's 100%, but for those people in the back who are gonna act like they don't understand what she means when she says we carry the burden, not only do we carry the burden, but every person on this panel could very well be that person. Carry the burden. Not only do we carry the burden, but every person on this panel could very well be Breonna Taylor, could very well be Amar Arbery, could very well be George Floyd. We are parents on here. Mary has children, Clyde has sons, I have sons. All of us at any moment, any day or night, y'all love us so much, we could be that person. So Correct. not only do we have Correct. the burden of Correct. feeling their pain and their family's pain, our families could feel the same pain because it could be one of us at any given time. So for anybody who doesn't really, they want to act like they don't understand what she's saying, Look at it that way. Look to your left, look to your right, look to your coworker, look to that bartender, look to whoever you want, and say, damn, well, one day, he might not be here or she might not be here. Yo, love, the same love, reason. Just add love, something. love us like you love our culture. Exactly. But I just want to add something as well, because, uh, and really to what you said earlier when you started speaking, Ian, when I first was asked about doing this panel, um, and one of the piece that I looked at was what does change really look like? My son's 12 today. Mm. I thought, Happy birthday. birthday. Happy birthday. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I, I Thank you. Today. The, thing, the first thing that went across my mind is what does real change look like? Real change looks like for me when I don't have to have the conversation. Yeah. 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 If, yeah. When I, whenever I have the conversation, I had a conversation with him today. And whenever I have the conversation, it puts me in a really different space where my white colleagues do not ever have to do that yeah yeah they never ever have to do that so that's a societal thing so when we no longer have to have the conversation with our children we may be able to turn up at work and tee hee hee all day <laughs> you know like, what I mean? like, can we live can Please. we just live? And maybe Please. this panel, and maybe this panel next time won't have to be the first all black panel. Maybe the panel of just professionals because Correct. all of us in here are bad asses, no matter what we look like. Correct. When we no longer need panels like this, then that that's when it's uh, until then, keep fighting. Yeah. When the no, world the first stops, that's when we when it's it stops being the first this, the first that, the first yeah. this. And to me, it's ridiculous in 2020 that yeah. our firsts are based on our complexion. <laughs> on, That's on difficult. That note, but 2020, that 2020 is the mark of the new century. This is a new no. century, and we well, are we, the leaders we, of the new century. We, we have the space we're, 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 to grow we're, the new century. 
We're way, way over time because y'all are black people and you do everything late. Don't do us like that, Jackie. No, no, don't do us like that. No, don't do us like that. Don't you? Don't, don't no. Time, no. 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 They gave us an hour. Hour. No. Hour. No. Hour. no. Well, listen, for real. Hey. Wait, they gave us an hour. We took an hour and a half. It's not nearly enough time to have this conversation. It's not nearly enough. Not enough people were here. Not enough was said. We can talk about this all day long, but I want to be respectful of the platform. You are all future ancestors. I love you all. Stay black. Stay safe. His official Wakanda name is Mbubu. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. We're done. Love y'all, man. Love, love y'all, man. Peace and light. Peace and light. Stay on. We can hang out about the